Well, this is um, the second segment of my lecture on the Gambia versus Myanmar case. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about the stages in the proceedings uh, to date. The, um, the case began, as I mentioned, with the filing of an application by, um, by the Gambia. The application itself is not a lengthy document. The, the, the applicant sets out uh, generally what their claim is, but the bulk of their submission um, prior to the prior to the eventual trial as such uh, is done uh, subsequently. Um, following the filing of the application, uh, both of the parties were then asked to uh, appoint what's called an ad hoc judge. So the International Court of Justice has um, 15 judges who are elected um, by the through, through the election process. And uh, when you have states before the court uh, who do not have a judge of their nationality on the bench, they are entitled then to propose the appointment of an ad hoc judge. And so both, uh, both uh, the Gambia and Myanmar did that. Myanmar appointed a South African. Again, typically the judges are appointed from, from the country, but in this case, uh, the Gambia appointed a South African uh, judge, the former High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, and uh, uh, Myanmar appointed a very distinguished German law professor, uh, Klaus Kress. And um, they were both sworn in as the first item of business when the court convened for its first, uh, the first hearing uh, associated with the proceedings. And there may be a series of, of hearings before the court gets to the final judgment. Um, the first was a, a hearing on what are called provisional measures by the court. And that took place uh, in December, 10th, 11th and 12th of December of last year. And then about a month later, the court issued a provisional measures order. I'm, I'm just gonna show you a little bit from the hearing. Um, let me, let's just, yeah, these are all uh, recorded uh, and available on the UN website. You can watch the hearings. They're quite long. I'm not gonna show you for very long, but I thought you'd like yeah. to see this a little Northern bit. Northern Rakhine, an army base near Palawa. This is the head of government of Myanmar, Aung San Suu Kyi, who's speaking. And some 200 insurgents have surrounded a military column near An city in Rakhine. Since Myanmar gained independence in 1948, our people have not known the security of sustainable development that is a fruit of peace and prosperity. Our greatest challenge is to address the roots of distrust and fear, prejudice and hate that undermine the foundations of our union. We shall adhere steadfastly to our commitment <coughs> to nonviolence, human rights, national reconciliation and rule of law as we go forward to build the democratic federal union to which our people have aspired for generations past. We look to justice as a champion of the reconciliation and harmony that will assure the security and rights of all peoples. Mr. President and members of the court, I thank you for your kind attention and I ask that you now call upon Professor William Shabers to continue the Myanmar submissions. I thank the agency of Myanmar for her statement. I now invite Professor Shabas to take the floor. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Mr. President, your excellencies, it's an honor to appear before the court today. Our hearing today does not concern the merits of the claim that the Gambia seeks to bring. It is confined to whether the court should indicate provisional measures. It's established case law that certain preconditions must be met if the court is to do so. My presentation will focus on the requirement of a plausible claim. I will be followed by Mr. Starker, Star Staker, who will speak to the requirements of prima facie jurisdiction and standing, and then by Ms. Okawa, who will complete our first round of observations by addressing the lack of real and imminent risk of irreparable prejudice to the rights in dispute. 
The Gambia seems to accept the plausibility test developed in the court's jurisprudence, but has misunderstood the standard applied by the court. The plausibility requirement is a necessary corollary of the mandatory nature of the court's provisional measures. For this reason, the references to provisional measures orders in 1993 may not be as helpful to the court as the Gambia suggested yesterday, given that they were adopted well prior to the court's important ruling on binding provisional measures in the Lagrange case. The Gambia claims that the rights it alleges are plausible provided they are based on a mere, and I quote, possible interpretation of the convention. Well, I'm not gonna continue there. Um, it goes on for about an hour, as I recall. Um, in the actual hearings, I think we spent three, more than th three half days. So there was, in, th in those three days, um, two mornings and then part of one morning and part of the afternoon of the third day. Um, and uh, if the case goes to what we call the merit stage, um, it's quite possible that we will have hearings that will go on for a matter of weeks before the court. Um, typically at the International Criminal Court, the, uh, the International Court of Justice rather, um, there's very little in terms of the actual production of evidence and uh, almost the, the bulk of the, uh, of the time is taken up with the oral submissions by the parties, sometimes with questions from the judges. So um, let's just go back now to the, the stages. As I mentioned, the, the uh, oral hearing last December was on the application for provisional measures. Um, and uh, the court issued the provisional measures in uh, late January. Uh, amongst the provisional measures, it's something the court has done uh, in other cases, it ordered uh, Myanmar to make a, a report on its compliance with the provisional measures. And Myanmar submitted that report uh, in May of, of 2020. Um, the uh, next stage in the proceeding is the filing of a memorial by the Gambia on, uh, in October of uh, 2020, and the submission of a second report on provisional measures by Myanmar um, in uh, November of 2020. So those are the stages that have taken place at the time of this lecture. And uh, there's more, of course, to come. I'll get to that in a minute. Let me just tell you about the provisional measures and, and what's, what's happened there. I'll, I'll make this a little bigger. So this is the provisional measures order that was issued by the, uh, by the uh, court. Uh, the first paragraph, uh, there, there are essentially four provisional measures in the order. The first paragraph uh, requires Myanmar to take all measures to prevent the commission of acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention. So in other words, it's an order to Myanmar uh, not to uh, commit genocide in violation of the Convention. Uh, the second paragraph is order, uh, orders Myanmar in, to ensure that it's military as well as any irregular armed units, which may be directed and supported by it, uh, don't commit any of the acts. So this is a, uh, more of an obligation of means to, to prevent others from committing genocide, whereas the first paragraph is about Myanmar itself committing acts of genocide. Then the third paragraph uh, requires Myanmar to take effective measures to prevent the destruction uh, and ensure the preservation of evidence. And the fourth paragraph requires Myanmar to submit reports. And I've, I just mentioned that uh, those there have been two reports to date. Uh, I should tell you as well that these materials remain uh, confidential uh, until the time of the, uh, of the actual hearing on the merits, which, which could be a few years from now. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the Gambia has not uh, suggested that it would that the report uh, that Myanmar submitted in May should be made public, and Myanmar has not either. So that remains, it's with the court, but it's not public. And Myanmar's memorial, where it sets out its case in, in depth, is not, uh, uh, is not available either. These will only be available maybe in a few years. And so I'm not really at liberty to talk to you about the content of them, um, or to, to uh, certainly I can't give you copies of them. Um, that's the way the court works. It's not that way with 
many tribunals, but the, the tradition at the International Criminal Court, at the International Court of Justice rather, uh, because of the, the fact that it is a, uh, um, a, a concession by states to their sovereignty is uh, extremely careful about, uh, about such, such matters. And this has been the, the tradition, I think, since the court started, we're now pretty much at the 100th anniversary of the creation of the International Court of Justice. Um, note as well that the order, I mean, these are, uh, we have provisional or measures type orders or interim measures orders or interim injunctions or similar proceedings in, in many judicial environments, including uh, the law here in the United Kingdom. Um, I used to, when I practiced uh, um, much more ordinary forms of law, I used to practice family law and we would go and get provisional measures orders um, generally to protect um, the, uh, the wife who was uh, threatened by violence from the, the husband. Um, you'll notice that these orders are, that the first two orders are essentially to, to respect the law. Um, they're, they're not more intrusive than that. And of course, parties like Myanmar will answer, but we're doing that anyway. We, we're, we are bound by the genocide convention. So, you know, you don't need to order us to respect the genocide convention. Of course, Myanmar hasn't answered the provisional measures order, but, but that would be a, um, a, a legitimate uh, reaction to it, I think. Um, and uh, if you were doing it domestically, if you went to a judge here in London and said, judge, I want an order to the, tell the, the husband not to, not to beat his wife, the judge would say, well, that's absurd. We don't order. He's not allowed to beat his wife anyway. It's against the law. So we're not going to order him to respect the law. He has to respect the law anyway. Um, and you might get an order that would be something like not to go within 500 meters of the family residence or, or something of that nature that's more concrete. You, you do have provisional measures orders of the International Court of Justice and of human rights courts like the European Court of Human Rights, but, but the, more typically they are ordering you not to do something that you're otherwise lawfully author, authorized to do, like for example, expelling someone from your country or sending someone back to a country where they'd be subject to torture or to the death penalty or something. So this is the, the nature of the order. Uh, one of the judges of the court, I think once referred, referred to them as feel good orders because they actually don't encroach very much in the sovereignty of, uh, on the sovereignty of the states. Um, but that's what the order is. And as I say, the, uh, the reports have been filed and um, uh, yeah, that's as much as I can say about it, okay? Um, I mentioned that there are countries that uh, so, seek to intervene, and they've been generating a lot of publicity. Uh, they've made these uh, public declarations. In the case of um, of the Maldives, it was uh, particularly dramatic because the lawyer for the Maldives is a rather well-known personality. She is married to a, a, a somewhat well-known actor in Hollywood. Um, she's a barrister here in London. You'll know who I'm talking about. Um, but uh, that was done several months ago, and then uh, then uh, Canada and the Netherlands, um, I think in August, announced that they were planning to intervene. And Canada made a big point of saying that it was going to intervene, intervene particularly to bring in uh, material about sexual violence uh, and gender crimes committed uh, during, the, uh, uh, during the events in question. So here are the provisions. There are two articles in the statute of the International Court of Justice that govern the intervention. It, it's an unusual proceeding to, to intervene, although there have been cases in the past. So there, there are two types of intervention. Uh, one is one that requires uh, permission from the court and the other is one that is uh, of right. Um, Article 62 is the one that requires um, permission. And it says so the state that considers it as an interest of a legal nature that could be affected by the decision of the case may ask to be permitted to intervene. Um, and uh, um, there have been a, a few cases of that where states have asked to intervene, uh, but it doesn't look like this, it's Article 62 paragraph one that's going to be applied, partly because of the need to demonstrate an interest of a legal nature. Um, the Dutch government, uh, which made this announcement, uh, answered some parliamentary questions. So there's some public explanation from the Netherlands 
where they were, and, and so their lawyers or, or their, their minister explained to the parliament what they had in mind. And I think they explained that they were not going to apply under paragraph six, under article 62, paragraph one, but rather they would be intervening under article 63. So article 63 uh, uh, says that whenever the construction of a convention to which states other than those concerned in the case are parties is in question, the registrar shall notify all states forthwith. So that's happened in this case because it's about the construction uh, of the genocide convention. And this is every state so notified has the right to intervene in the proceedings. But if it uses this right, the construction given by the judgment will be equally binding upon it. So Article 63, Paragraph 2 suggests, I think, that the intervention under Article 63 is, is about the interpretation or the construction of the treaty rather than about factual issues. And, and I think this is confirmed when we look at the rules. I'll just move this out of the way. The rules of the International Court of Justice, which talks about the intervention. Well, let's go back, sorry. Bear with me, move this. there we are. Article 62, uh, Article 82 of the rules of the, uh, of it. Uh, discusses the intervention and uh, it says that the intervention in, in paragraph two um, shall give the particulars under which the state is a party to the convention, the provisions of the convention that it considers to be in question, in this case it would be, I think, article two of the convention, a statement of the construction of those provisions for which it contends, and a list of documents in support which documents shall be attached. So. You know, it's it. Although Canada, you know, might have suggested that it might have implied that it was going to come with evidence of sexual and gender-based crimes, I think that um, the reading of these provisions suggests that probably the scope is rather more limited. Um, but we are in an area where the law is is a work in progress, and where uh, um, we we don't we don't know exactly what 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 they have in mind. The intervening states. Um, We'll have to wait on that, but it will be interesting. And all of this is contributing to the to the legal interest aside from the more political or human rights interest um, in the case. So what are the next stages in the case? Well, I mentioned that in October of uh, this of this year of 2020, um, the um, uh, Gambia made its its main submission, which is called the memorial. And so this is where it sets out its case in detail. Memorials are typically hundreds of pages long and often accompanied by lengthy uh, annexes of, of evidence. The, the evidence before the court, by the way, this is not a court that uh, typically uh, has a lot of evidence. Um, and this case is, is fairly unique in that respect as well in terms of the nature of the evidence. So I can just say a word about what, what um, about how that would be proven because uh, the Gambia has to prove that Myanmar committed the genocide. Um, in the two cases that I referred to uh, under the genocide convention that actually went to a full trial, that's the, the one of Bosnia and the other one of, of Croatia against Serbia. Um, they came, they, they, were, they were heard in the case of, of Bosnia in, in 20, 2006 and in the case of uh, Croatia in 2014. And by that time, uh, you had a huge body of evidentiary material and evidentiary findings from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, which had been uh, dealing with cases on the territory uh, since, since it began operations really in, in 1994. And so you, you had a great deal of evidence that had been produced in judicial proceedings that had been subject to cross-examination and that had subsequently been assessed by the judges of the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. And so in the judgments, the court um, made the point that this was um, highly reliable evidence and the findings uh, of the, you know, the, the materials that were generated by the tribunal were extremely important and the court was very deferential to them. Um, the same type of material doesn't exist in the Myanmar case. Um, there are the, there is the report to which I referred of the UN fact-finding mission. There's another, it, it did a, a number of reports actually 
and gathered a, a body of materials, but the, the materials are not public. Uh, it's not clear that they're available. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the findings of them are in the reports, but the reports are, first of all, they're, they're, they're hearsay, really. They're just reports on, they're not, it's not the evidence as such, but an interpretation of them. And it's an interpretation of them by a body that says that it's applying a standard of reasonable grounds. Um, so uh, this, is, this is new, this is novel, and uh, um, that's what's out there. Um, and, and we'll have to see what, what the quality of the evidence is that's produced. And of course, then it will be up to Myanmar. Myanmar will have the option of, of producing its own evidence and possibly uh, having some of the, some testimony um, during the hearings on the merits uh, when they take place. Um, following the submission of the memorial, um, the, the statute of the court or the rules give Myanmar three months to decide whether it wants to make preliminary objections. So this doesn't happen in all cases, but it's not an uncommon thing in, uh, in litigation before the International Court of Justice that there are preliminary objections based on jurisdiction and admissibility. It's possible for a state to waive that phase and to reserve its rights to make preliminary objections on the merits. So that's another option, but Myanmar will have to take that decision uh, within three months. And if it has preliminary objections, it will have to submit them within three months. Then there will be a reply from uh, the Gambia. And then uh, one would expect there'll be an oral hearing. So that could be sometime in the middle of 2021 or late 2021. And then there would be a decision on the preliminary objections issued by the court, which could take another, you know, a matter of months to be issued. So perhaps if, if Myanmar takes that route, we're looking at maybe early in 2022, when that, when the ruling on preliminary objections would be, um, would be issued. And at that point, Myanmar then has uh, nine months, which is the amount of time that, that the Gambia had to submit its counter memorial. That's, that's where it sets out all of its arguments and, uh, and its evidence. And it's possible for the court to then allow a second round of written submissions um, that may or may not happen. That's up to, that's in the discretion of the hearing of the court. And then there's a, an oral hearing, um, as I say, something that, that quite possibly could last a number of weeks. And then typically again, six to 12 months, something like that for the court to issue its its judgment. So several years ahead of us on this, probably. Um, I think I'm going to stop here and resume in the, in a, in a, because I'm going to talk about a few other details of this case. No, let, let's just finish it. I think, I think I can do it on this, on this recording. I want to say a few words about the relationship to the proceedings at the International Criminal Court, because there's also a case involving uh, Myanmar at the International Criminal Court. The International Criminal Court, you know, lives about three kilometers from the International Court of Justice. Um, judge Pile, who is the ad hoc judge on the International Court of Justice for the, for the Gambia, was previously a judge of the International Criminal Court. Um, so there's a, you know, they're, they're not related but they're, they're not far apart either, these two bodies. The International Criminal Court is, of course, concerned with prosecuting individuals. And um, about uh, uh, more than two years ago, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court developed a theory that would enable her to deal with um, the cases arising out of the, of the situation in, in Myanmar. Um, her problem there was that Myanmar had not, uh, was not a party to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and therefore there's, in principle, no territorial jurisdiction over Myanmar and no jurisdiction over the nationals of Myanmar, which is something that comes with being a party to the International Criminal Court. But the prosecutor's theory was that the crime against humanity of deportation uh, involved a, a crossing of an international border. And uh, many of the uh, refugees who, uh, who fled from Myanmar in 2017 uh, went to neighboring, crossed to neighboring Bangladesh where they had been living in 
uh, in camps, in, in refugee camps uh, since then. Uh, there are said to be about 750,000 of them in uh, refugee camps in and around Cox's Bazar, which is a town in, in Bangladesh, close to the border with Myanmar. And uh, so the, uh, um, the prosecutor's theory was that the, the definition of deportation involves crossing an international border. And so the crime was actually the crime of deportation that she alleges took place in both countries and uh, was connected in that sense. B Bangladesh is a party to the Rome statute. So she said that she had jurisdiction, therefore, over acts of deportation. Now, not over acts of genocide, but over the crime against humanity of deportation committed in Myanmar. Um, she wasn't certain enough of it to proceed uh, without first going to the judges and asking them if they would, uh, if they would agree with her interpretation of jurisdiction, of territorial jurisdiction. And uh, they not only agreed with it, but they said, and you could actually do more. They said, you might even be able to prosecute for other crimes against humanity because of the suffering of the people um, in the refugee camp. And that that suffering, they said, was uh, maybe connected to the fact that they couldn't return to, uh, to Myanmar. So these are, are, are questions that remain to be properly litigated. The fact that the pretrial chamber gave a green light to the prosecutor doesn't uh, mean that the question is, is settled because these were ex parte proceedings. There were no defense counsel there. Nobody's been charged. And so until that happens, until somebody's actually charged by the prosecutor and then brought into custody because the court cannot proceed in absentia, the real uh, judicial battles about these issues um, will not take place. Uh, and uh, uh, the prosecutor's biggest obstacle, of course, is because Myanmar is not a state party. It has no obligation to cooperate with the prosecutor. It doesn't have the, any obligation to arrest people or to transfer them to the court. So I think that really gives you a, an overview of, of these issues. And uh, we can discuss in more detail some of the, um, of the legal issues, the technical legal issues that arise relating to this very interesting, novel, original case before the International uh, Court of Justice. It, it seems to be part of a, of a broader phenomenon that we see not just at the International Court of Justice, but in other bodies like the European Court of Human Rights and uh, some of the treaty bodies created by the, uh, within the UN system, like the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, which is the, the willingness of states to, um, to file human rights complaints, essentially, against other states, uh, including in cases where they have little or no direct interest with the case, but where they're, you know, they purport to be acting as, uh, as good global citizens taking these cases. Um, and so there have been, I think in the last, uh, in this year, 2020, there have been more applications interstate applications filed at the, at the European Court of Human Rights than ever before. And uh, that there's, there's just more going on here. And the, uh, the application by the Gambia uh, and the, the intention of other states to intervene in the proceedings seems to be a manifestation of this. Um, whether the courts themselves will embrace this or whether they will rebuff them saying, you know, this isn't really, we're not really the place for this. These are these are disputes that are becoming politicized, whatever remains to be seen. And I think this, this case of, of the Gambia uh, versus Myanmar will be a good, a good example. And I'll be happy to talk more about this when I see you in the class.